So we're here at ETH Denver, and this is Arthur Brock from Holochain, and it's great to have you here. So Holochain is a little different than blockchain, right? But it's uh, very closely related to blockchain technology. So could you describe that a little bit for, for people that just know vaguely about blockchain? Sure. Uh, first of all, thanks, Eric, for having me here. Um, yeah, Holochain is not a blockchain technology. It's not derived from blockchain. It actually is kind of an inversion of the, the model in that blockchain stores everything on, I'm going to call it a central ledger because everybody has to have the same version of it. it there's many copies, so in that sense it's decentralized, mm -hmm. but it's one global state, and so there's a lot of energy that goes into the management of the consensus on that global state and the gossip between all of the nodes. And so you end up with scalability problems inherent in that architecture. Mm -hmm. The way that Holochain is the same is that um, it is a project for decentralizing things, taking it out of the, the control of one mm -hmm. central party or authority. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's like the kind of the, the promise of blockchain is big mm -hmm. and I think it's good, mm -hmm. right, about let's change our patterns for how to organize and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. My concern is that I don't think that the architecture will scale to, to all of the use cases we really want that are really useful to us. So you can't, in any time in the near future, I don't think blockchain is going to be able to run something at Facebook scale. Mm -hmm. Holochain can. Uh -huh. And it's because we are not managing global state, we're managing global discoverability of local state. Mm -hmm. And a set of... Uh, rules essentially that every node has to play by and there's mutual enforcement of those rules and so you still get validation um, what you don't get is consensus and it turns out if you learn how to architect your solution in an agent-centric manner you don't need consensus mm -hmm. pretty much ever mm -hmm. um, and that that's usually a very uh, controversial statement to mm -hmm. people because they're used to thinking only in those terms mm -hmm. and so learning about how to build on Holochain requires a mindset, mm -hmm. a, a mind shift in mm -hmm. terms of being able to think about your problem differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear that because uh, blockchain technology likes to call itself decentralized and uh, that's essentially because it's serverless and because it uh, consists of uh, many computers uh, together collaborating but the state is uh, conceptually centralized in, in, in a sense. Right. And, and so, so the way I understand it is that Holochain um, has uh, many local blockchains in a sense um, and, 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 and a ways for those to consolidate their state, right? Yeah, so every agent in a Holochain application, anybody who can take an action, has their own source chain or, or authoring chain, if you will. Mm -hmm. And only the changes that they make, the state changes that they contribute to the system, are written to their chain. They're signed in a hash chain. It's not a block chain as in a block of many changes in one thing. It's one change at a time. Mm -hmm. So that gives us our time. Because one of the problems with distributed systems is time of events. But um, so, for example, if we're doing a currency on Holochain, we structure that like a crypto accounting kind of system where my hash chain is my account history of all of the ins and outs and you can run through it really fast and see what my current state is, what my balance is, right? And when you do a transaction, if you and I were to do a transaction in a currency built on Holochain, we would both countersign the transaction to each of our chains. And we don't need global consensus because nobody else's state is changing. Mm. The only two chains affected are ours, and we have the authority, author, like really, right, the authority mm -hmm. to sign to our chains. We're the only ones with that authority. Mm -hmm. um, and so we don't need anybody else's permission or consensus. But then when that transaction uh, replicates, is published to our DHT, mm -hmm. so the shared space in Holochain, Holochain is a distributed hash table mm -hmm. instead of a blockchain. Um, that's a content addressable space that's actually easy to shard. Blockchains are hard to shard. Mm. So this allows us to have something that is already sharded into microchains at the individual level and then sharding global storage as well. Mm -hmm. So not everybody has to validate a transaction. Mm -hmm. But the nodes who receive that transaction to store it will validate it. And so you can 
you you can detect fraud within the system. You can detect double spends. You can all these different things that you can do um, that you need to do to ma manage a secure cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. You can still do on Holochain, and you don't need global consensus or global time because you always know what order things happened in the space where state changed. Mm -hmm. We know our two chains that that transaction came after my previous transaction, after your previous transaction, before our next ones. Mm -hmm. There's no ambiguity about time and global time is irrelevant, mm -hmm. right? Because there's no global state. There's yeah. global discoverability of local state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that plays very nicely off of like Einstein's uh, theory of relativity. And, exactly, um, Ex exactly. I mean, in the real world, there is not global state. Mm -hmm. I could say, hey, how hungry are you right now? Give me like a status bar check of how hungry, are you really hungry or uh, I just ate some food and right. And we could do, we go around the room and get everybody's status bar. Uh -huh. We did not just determine global room hunger. Uh -huh. We did not determine the hunger of the room. There's no global state mm -hmm. of hunger. That state is local. Mm -hmm. And I think actually you lose data integrity when you start to pretend that data has existence independent of its provenance, independent of who created it. Mm -hmm. um, and so what Holochain's data integrity model is, it's always tied back to the source chains, back to the author's chains with the signatures that are required for being able to publish to the DHT. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it just it's a different place, a different space mm -hmm. in which to build things. But it turns out it's super scalable and super fast. You can play mm -hmm. almost real-time-ish games on it, which you can't do on blockchain mm -hmm. or with global consensus. And you can do things on extremely large scales because it's easy to shard. Yeah, and, and isn't it true that uh, when more nodes join the network, it actually improves the, the, the speed as opposed to <laughs> traditional blockchains where um, the more nodes that join, it tends to bog it down. Is that the case? Yeah, there's a number of architectures out there that are blockchain variants that are only performant at all by constraining the number of nodes, mm. right? So you have like... EOS, which has raised, you know, like $5 billion in the space, but runs on 21 nodes, right? You get, it's very centralized. Like to me, that's not even decentralized. That's like a cluster, you know? And when it's, anyway, projects like NEO and Tron and that kind of stuff, the way that they get speed is they say, well, there's only going to be a small number of trusted nodes. And that kind of defeats the whole sort of trust list, meaning you, you are not having to trust a third party authority in the system um, of crypto technology, right? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so with Holochain, if you set up, let's say you, you wanted to redeploy Twitter mm -hmm. on Holochain as a peer-to-peer -peer app instead of a centrally hosted web app, mm -hmm. right? 330 million active users tweeting 1.1 times a day, you know, that's what, 363 million tweets a day on Ethereum's best day, it did 1.8 million transactions. You know, so we're like orders of magnitude off, and that's just for the tweets, not for likes or follows or retweets or you know, like this is there's a there's a whole bunch of other activity that the system also has to replicate. Mm -hmm. If you were doing that on Holochain with the same numbers, and let's say you set up a redundancy level of um, 100 where you wanted to keep 100 copies of every tweet or every action on the DHT at a time. You could run this on your phone where you basically would have to devote two seconds of processing every 13 minutes you know, to validate your 110 tweets a day that you would have to validate out of 100 multiplier times 1.1 tweets, anyway. Um, and after about a year that you'd have accumulated about one 12 megapixel photo of data. Mm -hmm. That is super scalable. Mm -hmm. You can do that. You can run a dozen of those apps on your phone. Mm -hmm. You can't run blockchain nodes on your phone. Mm -hmm. They just can't keep up with the, with the gossip, the consensus, the proof of work, the staking, the, you know, like none of, none of that scales. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, what's also worth touching on for our listeners to hear is that uh, your model is based on uh, biomimicry, right, and, and um, the agent-centric model. Yes. So, so, so let's talk about that for a minute. Well, we're basically stealing this pattern from nature. We're copying it from nature. The cells in your body, you know, you have trillions of cells in your body operating on scale in an incredible way 
not because they're synchronizing some global state. Can you imagine if each cell had to internalize all the state changes of all the other cells, mm -hmm. right? Like, and, and then gossip all that information to be able to coordinate, you know, like, you just, it, fundamentally unscalable approach, and yet that's what we do in most distributed systems. Mm -hmm. um, and so what instead happens is each cell has a rule set, the DNA, right, that it can check other actions, you know, against, so it can validate for itself what it's doing, mm -hmm. and it embodies its own state. So that's what we're doing with chains, is that, you know, a local chain, you write your state changes to your own thing, embodying your own state, right, just like the cell in your body. And then the DNA is actually the very first entry in, in each node's chain. Uh, the genesis entry is the DNA, which proves what hashes out to the same hash, means we're following the same rules. Mm -hmm. So the validation rules that I'm holding you to are in my first, you know, entry of my chain. And yours are in your first entry of the chain. And we know that we have the same rules. Otherwise, we're not in the same network. Mm -hmm. It's part of the encryption salt for the network. Mm -hmm. You're not even talking to each other if you're not following the same rules. Mm -hmm. So you have this term called DNA. Um, yes. And, and <laughs> so, um, if two different applications um, emerge uh, based on Holochain, but they are um, detached from each other and they're using a different model, um, how can they then come together to share the same DNA so that they can collaborate? Uh, can, can, can they grow together? No. Oh, okay. They, I mean, well, they could essentially merge by both becoming a new DNA that they then put an update process from their old and they both up, update to a new but generally speaking that's not a desired goal you gotcha. don't want you don't what we're saying is from a security perspective the security model of abstracting permissions of a network based system like this is somewhat impossibly complex for programmers to get right mm -hmm. so instead what you do if you have app a and app b and you want them to talk to each other well Anybody can run app A and app B on the same device mm. and give myself permission in A to talk to myself in B and, they, and I become a bridge and I'm now operating under my agency, my permissions in both of those contexts. Mm -hmm. We don't have to create a more complex abstraction about permissions and that kind of stuff. So it keeps it secure and stable and uh, Private in that each each app is its own encrypted network, which may have rules about how people people can declare addresses into the space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, it is quite an inversion and quite different from uh, what uh, most people in the space are used to. So, how's your traction going, and, and and what's your your future looking like for this coming year? And 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 who's who's jumping on board with your technology? Yeah, yeah. we're one of those kind of stealth projects in that we. We don't hype our token. We did actually do an ICO that had a temporary ERC-20 token called HOT. And uh, according to ICO Analytics, just tweeted this a day or two ago, we're actually currently the best performing ICO of all of 2018. Um, but we don't really promote our token and stuff. And we don't go out there hyping the project much either because we actually haven't launched the Holo network. Holochain has been around for a number of iterations. We built a version in Go, and a lot of cool apps, about 50 or 60 apps were built on Go, uh, the Go version. And then we're rebuilding in Rust for greater security and memory safety and a lot of other, other issues. But it has taken longer than we hoped. So the first project we're really launching on the Rust-based version is Holo. People confuse Holo and Holochain, probably our fault for two similar branding, but Holo is our way of having Holochain apps reach mainstream web browsers. Mm. So that, because Holochain is completely peer-to-peer, -peer. you have to be running an instance of the app to speak to other nodes on the app. But if you want, if you make a, a fair b, &B app on your, on, on Holochain, and you want grandma, who's not gonna install some next-gen crypto tool mm -hmm. on her computer, to be able to access it, she just wants to type in fairbnb.org into a web browser, and search for vacation homes, right? Mm -hmm. And so what that what Holo does is it allows certain whatever whatever Holochain nodes want to basically to extend 
grandma virtual hosting of her, her holochain space, right? So it's like grandma doesn't have a peer, so I will host her peer, but I will get paid by Airbnb for the hosting service for doing so. And so what that lets us do is remove that barrier of like a user having to figure out how to deal with gas or, you know, different things like that and people be able to just jump right into using web apps like they're used to. So is there anything else you want to tell our listeners how to get involved and how to um, st start building their apps or make contacts? Sure. I'm also realizing I didn't fully answer your last question, oh. but... Um, Okay, so back to your last question about the kinds of things we're running into in the space. What's so great about the space is that blockchain has ignited the imagination of a lot of people. So now there's a big kind of receptive uh, space for this kind of thing being possible, which just a few years ago, when you would have conversations with people like this, they were just like, shut up, this doesn't make any, you know. Um, however, what it's also done is it has trained people's patterns of thinking in certain ways which don't apply to Holochain. So it's created a bunch of false dichotomies about you know, private versus public chains or um, about centralization and decentralization instead of like distributed, which Holochain is completely peer-to-peer. -peer. And you know, there's all of these things, and especially the way we do currencies, we don't implement them as tokens. We implement them as crypto accounting, right? Which could also let us navigate regulatory things very different because accounting is legal everywhere, right? It, accounting doesn't make something a security. Accounting doesn't make something a, a token or coin. And, uh, and there's also accountability that kind of comes with that. And so there's a bunch of things that work just a little bit different on Holochain that end up causing kind of confusion for people because they're like, oh, well, it isn't, it's either X or Y. And since it's not X, it must be Y. Or it's not Y, it must be X. But it's neither on Holochain. And they come in kind of carrying all these assumptions and we find we have to do a lot of reset on how things work. Mm -hmm. um, but to your last question of how people can get involved, um, holochain.org, holo.host is the hosting framework. We have events and hackathons and we have a dev pulse if you want to tap into the uh, flow of, of uh, updates on holo and holochain. Um, on, it's on medium.com slash holochain. Uh, and then we have uh, a chat community that's actually very active and super supportive. Um, Chat.holochain.org is a, a great place to, to go and ask questions, share projects, find developers, you know, do different kinds of things if you've got an idea and you want to connect with other people. Are there apps out there that people can experience that were built on Holochain that are available on the web? Yes, to a degree. We kind of downplayed the maturity of the previous version of Holochain and discouraged people from building like production level apps on it. So there aren't very many production level apps running. So there's like hum.earth, H-U-M-M dot earth, H -U -M -M .earth uh, which is basically a medium.com kind of blog, blog publishing platform. And um, there, there's a couple projects that sort of went in pr production in spite of us saying, don't do production on the old version. Uh, and it's taken us longer to launch the new version on Rust than hoped. So nobody is running live projects on the Rust thing yet. And in, in a couple of weeks, Holo's alpha launch of their testnet is going to be the first big project running on the new Rust version. Um, so that stuff, I mean, we have a bunch of groups building to it um, that have been participating in our dev camps and learning to build on the new Rust version. And one of the interesting things is that we're also making the new version GraphQL compatible. So it, it's very much, it can, can be a familiar-ish API to people or, you know, can interface with a lot of standards that, that exist. So it can be much more approachable. Great. And for those that are interested in your HOLO token, uh, I mean your HOTS token, H-O-T, um, I know it's listed on several exchanges, yeah. but is it also, can it be held in a wallet? Um, is it compatible with uh, wallets that hold uh, ERC-20 tokens and other... Yeah. Yeah, the hot token is just an ERC-20 temporary token uh, until we have Holofuel launched, the Holo Network live network mainnet launched, and then we can start swapping that out for Holofuel. So at the moment, it's on about 30 exchanges with about 10 pairings and uh, very actively traded. And um, as I mentioned, the mm -hmm. best performing ICO from 2018. Well, it's so great talking to you, Arthur, and uh, thanks for coming to East Denver. <laughs>